Um, so my name is Shalonda Brooks, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I got my doctorate degree in child clinical psychology at Auburn University in Alabama, War Eagle. Um, and currently, I work with um, young children and toddlers, so mostly under the age of 10. Um, I am located here at the Memorial Office, and I do counseling services. Um, I do a little bit of psychological testing, and I also work in our autism clinic. Um, and so my primary interest are kids with disruptive behavior disorders, so those kids that are tantruming and acting out, those are the kids I love to work with. So definitely <laughs> ask me questions about that. And then I just wanted to tell you what my parenting philosophy is. And my philosophy for parenting is that you as the parent is the expert on your child. My job is just to tweak the great parenting skills that you already have and help you adapt them and modify them so that they work for your child. How many kids? Ages and kids. Um, before we get started really quick, um, we wanted to take a poll of the audience and see um, what type of, of age ranges that um, you guys may have. So if you have a toddler three and under, raise your hand. Okay, I see some of those. Um, what about early childhood? So maybe three to six. A few of those too. Okay, six to ten. Okay, let's see our tweens, 10 to 12. Ooh, we got a good mix here. <laughs> and then um, parents who have teenagers. Okay, great. So we have a little bit of everyone, and we're going to try to cover all those different age ranges um, in our information today. Okay. Hello. I'm Jennifer Cole, and I have my master's in marriage and family therapy and women's studies from the University of Houston, Clear Lake. Yay. <laughs> um, I've been with DePelchin for about six years now, and I work primarily with our parent education program and our teen pregnancy prevention program. And so my programs are, I'm based here, but we work a lot in the community. We work a lot in the schools, and we try and go out to different areas to make parenting services accessible. And I usually work a lot more with teenagers, so I'm pretty familiar with some of the fun things that they do and some of the adventures that they provide. <laughs> Which kind of leads into my parenting philosophy, which is that parenting is an adventure. You never know what it's going to bring, and it offers all kinds of fun opportunities and some great challenges, but just go with it, and it'll be a good ride. All right. My name is Charity Eames, and my master's in, is also in marriage and family therapy, but my bachelor's is in psychology and Spanish. So we work with, my program works with a lot of English and Spanish-speaking families, uh, the program that I work on here at DePelchin is called Parenting Help, and it is specifically a home-based parenting support program for families in Galveston County. So we go out into the homes and work one-on-one -on -one with parents. A lot of our parents are at risk for child abuse and neglect, and a lot of them are just throwing up their hands saying, I'm not sure where to go next. I'm not sure what to do. Our program is specific for families that have a child 18 months to 12 years of age. So we work primarily with younger children. My parenting philosophy, I guess, comes from the way I was parented, which is actually where most of us get our parenting skills from. That's where we learn to be parents is when we're children ourselves. And the things that I always remember my mom saying was that all kids will grow up. Some will grow up. <laughs> Some will grow up like weeds, and some will grow up like flowers. It just depends on how much time and energy you're able to put into them. And also, her other cliche, I guess, was that a river without banks is a swamp. That kids need, kids need limits and boundaries. So I feel very strongly about those. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Mary Bosca. I'm the director of Major Gifts here at DePelchin. Welcome. Glad to see a lot of faces that have been with us a long time. Um, the flow for how we're going to cover the topics is going to mirror what you have in front of you, this little takeaway on positive parenting techniques. So I'm going to start off by asking some questions about uh, child, development, excuse me, child development and appropriate behavior expectations. And I'd like for you ladies to answer specifically for each age group so that all the parents in the audience can take away some tools for their specific children. So um, tell us a little bit about what are appropriate behavior <coughs> expectations. Yes. 
When I think of appropriate behavior expectations, I think it's important that parents do some research on your own. Um, there is so much that is available on the internet and books, and sometimes we can get a little, read a little too much into the internet and start looking, oh, my child's not doing this and that. Look for the ones and maybe talk to your doctors, talk to your pediatricians. They can give you really good information about what is appropriate for kids at certain ages. And what you're looking for, I think, is what's appropriate for children in a variety of areas, their cognitive areas, their physical development, their speech and language development, and their social development. Because that's something, I think when you think about child development, you can't put expectations on a child that they're not able to follow through on. So if you have a toddler, if you have a four-year-old, and you say, I am so busy today, will you please just take this laundry basket and take it to your room and put your stuff away? Well, you maybe have set your expectations a little too high when the laundry basket <laughs> falls down the stairs, and then not only do you have to put the laundry away, you have to refold it. And that's where parents get angry, and they're going, why can't you just do what I said? Because they can't. And then I've also heard parents of teenagers that say, you know, why don't they want to, why won't they listen to me? Why can they not just think ahead and think of the consequences of their actions? Because they can't. <laughs> they don't have the brain development. If you really look at it, we know that children's brains don't really develop all the way till they're 25. So when you're expecting a 17-year-old to say, think ahead and have the cognition to be able to do that, they're physically, cognitively not capable of it. And so sometimes when you go through and you do that research and you look into it, you go, you know, what I'm expecting of my child is too much. And we need to have very realistic expectations or we're going to be let down. And then that's going to come out in the way that we treat our children. Go ahead. I think piggy being backing on that, a lot of times with teenagers, they develop differently in different ways. So their cognitive development might be happening, but their social development might be advanced or might be back a little bit. So really focusing on knowing your child and saying, just because cognitively they're here and they can do these things and they're really performing well in school means that they're going to be able to perform at that same level socially or, you know, in another format. So really looking at, you know, we see a lot with gifted children. Parents expect gifted children to be able to perform at a higher level when, as Charity mentioned, they're just not there yet. They can't do it. And so that sometimes causes frustration with parents in really being able to look and say, okay, where is my child really at? What are they really capable of? If you're having the same conversations and the fights over and over and over again around the same issues, chances are it's probably some type of developmental issue where they may not be ready or they may not be really able to handle what you're asking of them. So that's also an opportunity to kind of step back and look at what am I really asking? Why are we having this conversation over and over and over again? Where is the challenge or where is the opportunity to look at how can we tweak this so it better fits their needs and actually helps you too? And I'm just going to quickly add that when I think about what's expected or what parents expect, I often often think in behavioral terms. So, um, and I think about misbehavior again. I work with disruptive kids. Um, so, a two-year-old having a tantrum, screaming, kicking on the floor, it's kind of expected for a two-year-old. Ten-year-old, not so much. Teenager, we hope not. Um, so again, when you're being frustrated or upset or the child's doing something you don't want to do, also looking at is that appropriate for the child's age? And then that can also help you decide whether you need um, additional help with dealing with that behavior. A two-year-old, maybe not. If you have a 13-year-old kicking and screaming and tantruming on, on the floor, you might want to um, get a little outside help because that's not typical for a teenager. <coughs> Their tantrums look totally different. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about how you can set your child up for success with regard to the goal setting and providing them opportunities to make choices that help them develop? One of the things that we talk about in parenting is controlled choices so that, you know, as your child is aging and developing, giving them opportunities to make choices in a controlled environment. And what that means is, you know, you control the groceries that come into the house. You control the clothes that are in their closet when they're little. So letting them be involved in the choices of, you know, I'm going to pick this shirt with this shoes or these pants 
it may not match and they may look a little different, but they got to be involved in that process. And they start becoming able to say, okay, well, if I choose this, I can't choose that. And it gets them practice. And you're letting them make decisions in an environment where you still have a lot of control so that as they get older and you're not as involved or they're more involved with their friends or they're getting outside influences, they've already started to filter through some of that process and they're able to make decisions a little bit, more, a little bit better. As they're getting older, when you're getting to middle school kids, you want them to be more involved. You want them to be making choices about what are their after school activities, what kind of things are they doing so that they're getting again more and more practice and as a high schooler if you have a high school child and you're still telling them what they should be involved in and what they should be doing it's you're kind of setting them up for some challenges when they get out because they get to college their freshman year we have a lot of seniors that we work with they get to college in their freshman year they've never had to manage their study time they've never had to be responsible for getting themselves to school they've never had to think about well you know I have this much money for food so what happens at the end of the semester when I'm out of money so the more you can allow them to make those littler decisions as they're getting older and as they're developing the more you're setting them up to be really good at it when they're out on their own and they're not going to have as much support and I think on the choices especially it starts when they're young like mm -hmm. she was saying these limited choices because that's part of the positive discipline portion you want it to be positive you want them to be able to choose but in that you decide so it's you may choose to eat your dinner and get to have dessert and save and play or you may choose not to eat your dinner and you may choose to go to bed early they're both choices that you can live with and they it's it's still maintaining that discipline it's still being able to get the kids to do which get them to do what you want them to do because ultimately as parents a lot of times that's just what we want is do what I want you to do with it but at the same time you're doing it in a positive way of giving them these limited choices but it, I think an important thing with choices is that never make never give limited choices if you can't live with it mm -hmm. so you can't give a choice of either you go and pick up your room or we're going on vacation without you <laughs> <laughs> you can't offer that to a six-year-old and a lot of times parents do that they, or they'll say something, you know, even more realistic, like either you pick up your room right now or we're not going to Grandma's birthday party. Well, you know in your heart you're not going to miss Grandma's birthday party. So if you, you have to be able, because you have to know they may choose, I don't want to go, and you have to be able to live with that. And I think also um, giving them the choices for behaviors that you want to see or behaviors you want to change. So if a child is playing very loud in your room while you're trying to do something, giving them the choice that you can play with a quiet toy or another good option, you can play outside because then they have an appropriate um, choice or option for something that they do want to do. So again, um, providing them with realistic choices and choices that are you can follow through. So instead of you weren't quiet, you're in timeout, giving them a way that they can do what they want to do in an appropriate setting. Great. Can you talk a little bit about creating like, the positive relationship and give us some specific examples of uh, activities that you can do from a variety of ages that help build that? <laughs> Um, I think when we talk about creating um, a positive relationship, keeping development um, in mind is really important. And with young children, you could do almost anything and they're going to have a good time. You could, you know, play with pots and pans. You can sit and read a book. Um, but thinking about as you, as kids get older, you know, a teenager may not want to do that with you. <laughs> So finding appropriate activities that they're going to enjoy will help develop that positive, um, positive relationship. I'm not a big fan of forced fun. So if you're trying to force them to do something they don't want to do, it's not going to be fun and it's going to defeat the purpose. One of the things we hear from teens a lot is that, you know, my parents don't understand, they don't listen. And I think because a lot of times as kids age, a lot of the conversation becomes about what they need to do or how they need to be preparing or how they, you know, how they need to be helping or all these other things. Give your teenagers an opportunity to be the expert. I mean, even if you are savvy on your smartphone, let your teenager help you. How does this work? How do these apps work? Talk to them, ask them about what's going on on Facebook. You know, what do they think about things that are going on? I think the media is fabulous. The media is fabulous fodder <laughs> for conversation. There's always something going on, either with the schools or with celebrities that you can ask your teenager. What did you think about that? 
And you always want it to be where they're doing most of the talking, asking really open-ended questions and not really necessarily providing what you think, but just allowing them that space to say, oh my gosh, that's crazy, or this girl at school, is ha this is what's happening with her, or you know, I have a friend who's going through that, and just really letting them kind of do most of the talking, but providing that space and that starter to say, you know, what did you think about, you know, what happened at the Oscars, or what do you think about, I don't even, I'm out of my team, but you know, there's always something going on that is usually good conversation starters. What, what do you think about Facebook? You know, what do you think about Google and pictures and texting and all that? They'll usually have really good opinions, and if you provide that space, they're usually pretty happy to share. And the two, two of the things that we really focus on in our program as far as positive parenting, the first one is praise. Have you ever heard praise what you want repeated? Yeah. It's, it works with everyone, your husbands too. If they do something <laughs> that you like, praise them for it. And not just general praise. I think a lot of the times we get into, hey, good job, that was great, thanks, mm -hmm. appreciate it, you're great. But the fact is, they may not know, they, you know, the example I give to parents is the child that wipes their dirty hands under the table and with the other hand picks up their food and puts it in the mouth and the parent says, hey, good job. Well, okay, I'll keep wiping my hands under the table. The child's not clear on exactly what it was. So being very specific, good job eating your dinner. Good job picking up your toys and putting them in the toy box. Good job doing your homework as soon as you get home from school. Letting them know specifically, this is what I like, because that feels good. It makes them go, ooh, you know, I'm happy. And when they feel good about themselves, they're going to want to do it again. And with the husband's part, you know, good job cooking dinner for me. And then they go, oh, she liked that. I'll do it again. The other piece of it is the engaging activities. We can do, how many of you have ever struggled with taking your kids shopping? <laughs> it's something that so many parents struggle with because typically what that involves is sit in the car, hold my hand, stay right here by me and be good. And that's boring to a child. You have to keep in mind, like they were saying, your develop, their developmental level and going, okay, wherever you go, there are things that you can do to engage a child. If you're out in public, the grocery store is one of my favorite examples because if you think about it, there are so many ways to use incidental teaching. You're in the produce aisle. Find me the green produce. This is an avocado. What does an avocado start with? What, what letter is that? Can you pick me out three oranges? Can, and then as kids get older, this continues to work. Hey, will you find me the, most, the, the cheapest tuna? Will you, uh, mom can't find the organic rice. Please go find this for me. Using kids, getting them involved, because if they're busy being helpers and getting praised when they do well, getting praised for it, they feel good and they're way too busy to run down the aisles. Works out when you're, in, you're at the store too. Find mom black pants. Find me something in this size. Keeping kids engaged and praising them for their good behavior is a great way to build a positive relationship because instead of yelling at them and being upset with them, y'all leave the store with them going, I'm a helper. Great. Uh, with regard to building positive relationships, can you talk a little bit about quality versus quantity? I know sometimes I'm just going to come clean as a working mom. And some days I'm a better parent than others. And so can you talk about quality versus quantity and the importance of taking care of yourself as a parent? Um, I work with, um, again, mostly younger kids, and I have parents do something I call special time, which is one-on-one -on -one time with that child, and we ask parents to do it five minutes a day. That's pretty much a commercial break from television. Um, but the key of why it works is there's no telephone, there's no TV, there's no cell phone, and we encourage parents to do it one-on-one -on -one with um, the child versus having siblings um, around necessarily and they can swap out and do it with their other kids too but that child for that five minutes is getting your individual attention and they will work for that attention and so it works really well um, to do just five minutes and it's not a long time but you'd be amazed in how much difference that makes when they have your undivided attention for five minutes versus split detention for attention for an hour. You know, you're talking to them while you're doing something else. So if you can get in as little as five minutes of individual time with all of the distractions turned off or away, it does make a big difference. When I think about quality versus quantity, you know, your kids doing homework. If they spend an hour doing their homework while they're watching TV, or if they spent five or ten minutes doing their homework with the TV off, they're going to get a lot more accomplished during that five or ten minutes. 
the same principle with quality time with your kids. If you're spending that time focused on them, then that's what it's all about. For it, that's what it's all about for them. And also, it works if they know they're going to get that. Then when you are on the phone trying to deal with business issues, and they come up and go, "Mom, mom, mom," and you're, just a minute. They go, "Okay." And they will walk away because they they have that trust that they will get their quality time later, and it's not something they have to fight for. And I think in terms of the self care, you know, it's like they say on the airplanes: the oxygen mask is going to drop. Do yours first. If you're not taking care of yourself as a parent, you're going to run out of energy, and you're not going to be. It's going to be harder to find those opportunities for quality time. People are so busy. People, have, you have jobs, you have friends, you have commitments. It's it, parenting is a lot. I mean, you. The more you can find ways to take care of yourself, you know, we talk to parents sometimes with the younger kids. You know, if your child's at daycare and you happen to get off work an hour, don't feel like you need to go pick your child up. Enjoy that hour. Drive around the block. Go walk around the mall. Go do something that kind of nurtures yourself a bit so that when you go to pick up your child, you're a little bit more revived. You have a little bit more of energy. If you need to go and take a nap. We're huge fans of find ways to nurture and take care of yourself so that the time and the energy that you have for your child is much, much, it's, you have a higher level of energy and you really can focus on that quality time. Okay, so what do you do if your spouse is not on the same page with you with regard to discipline and parenting philosophy? <laughs> Depelgence information is right on here. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, this is probably one of those areas that it may not hurt to seek help at some point. You know, I think that all, there's a lot of things that we can do on our own, but there's also a lot of times that we do need to seek professional help. And I think that sometimes a counselor can be beneficial as a mediator in letting the family know that it, this is an extremely important area, that the parents be on the same page. Now, that's not to say that kids can, kids are very resilient. And if, you know, there are studies that say if they have one parent doing what they're supposed to do, setting limits, being consistent, nurturing the child, kids will be fine. It's not like they're going to be harmed forever if the parents aren't on the same page. But it's going to create a much more hostile environment in the home in that the child may know they can play the parents off of one another. Mm -hmm. They see one parent is the good parent and the bad parent. And there are so many issues that end up arising that it's best to try to get on the same page. And a lot of times I think you have to go back to the history and have the two parents talk about how was I parented because that's why I'm parenting the way I am now and stepping out of that and saying how can we agree to parent together and be on the same page. I think following along with that, most of the time when I've seen that parents aren't on the same page, they really are if you dig a little further into the book. They want the same thing for the child or they want to see the same kind of behaviors. What's different is their, their ways of getting there. And so if you can bring them back to the focus of this is what we want to see and these are some routes that we can get there. And we'll get there quicker if we're driving together than if we take different routes that usually you can find a compromise and help them get on the same page. But it is really difficult when you have parents who have uh, take different approaches for discipline or, or for parenting. And it, it takes the child sometimes longer to pick up the skills we want to see. On the other hand, I've had parents come in or I'm working with one parent and the other parent is not as involved and I eventually get, well, you know, my husband or my wife wants to come in because, the, you know, they're seeing a difference in this child with me and they're not getting the same results. It's like, okay, now we're ready to start. And so, um, like Charity was saying, children are very smart and they pick up on that and they'll use it and they'll play it and they'll know exactly who they can get away with. Um, certain behaviors with it so they'll try you know grandma lets me stay up so <laughs> I'm gonna just tell grandma five more minutes until it's an hour later versus I know mom means business so she says go to bed go to bed so um, happy helping parents find a common goal and focus on that and then working with them of how they can get there together okay so on to misbehavior uh, one of the bullets there is talking about consequences, saying what you mean and mean what you say, and follow through. And I've heard you talk a lot about that in the examples. Can you talk about some appropriate discipline techniques? Uh, for example, how do you feel about spanking? Legally, <laughs> legally parents are allowed to spank their children. However, 
let's take a, a one of the your, well, let's take a toddler for example. Let's take a two year old, and the toddler does something that the parent doesn't like. So the parent spanks them, doesn't beat them, pops them, swats them one time on the bottom. A lot of parents say, "I'm just getting their attention. I'm. It's just a way to let them know that that's not what I want them to do." Now, what you've just taught that child is when you don't like something, you hit. And so kids that receive that, not even, I'm going to say on a regular basis, kids that that happens to, they're smart. They learn quickly. So when you take their blocks away, they may come up and swat at you. And that's why we see, we, you see parents out and their kids are hitting at them. And it's because the kids have learned when you don't like something that spanking is an option. Usually when I have parents that spank and they're coming in and their child is having behavior problems, you know, my first thing, is it working? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Probably not if you've come to see me. So that usually gets them in the door that if you've tried spanking and you're still having the same problems, maybe we need to try something else. Just like everything else that you do, if it's not working, you try something else. You don't keep at it. And so usually parents are pretty receptive to that. It's not working now, so let's see if we can find something that is working. I think there's two things that we talk about sometimes we'll hear parents you know I was spanked and I'm fine but when you look at the culture that children are growing up in now it's so significantly different if you look at what they're exposed to in the media bullying and things that are going on in schools kids really have to be prepared to deal with a whole different set of issues and develop a whole different set of coping skills and like Charity mentioned when you teach kids to spank or when you spank kids you're teaching them that that's how you solve a problem nobody in here has ever walked in and solved a work issue by smacking their boss or one of their coworkers. <laughs> you know you've not solved a problem with a friend by smacking him. So, so to a certain extent, you're not letting them learn easier, more appropriate ways to handle problems. You're teaching them that, that as a response. And again, you said you look at what they're dealing with now, and it doesn't. it's not really supporting them in terms of being able to really be successful in school. And the fact is there are a lot more positive discipline mm -hmm. techniques to use besides spanking. And parents get, in a week, I mean, parents get in a rut. They spank, or they ground, or they take things away. And one of my favorite things to teach parents is logical consequences, yeah. punishments that fit the crime. If your child is throwing their blocks, well, you could spank them, but how does that relate to them throwing the blocks? You could even put them in time out, or you could take the blocks away. It's something that makes, it's a punishment that fits the crime. If they write on the wall, they have to scrub the wall. A lot, and then parents will say, well, you know, where's the punishment in that? And the punishment is that you have stopped the behavior. You've stopped the misbehavior. Because we have to think, a lot of times we don't necessarily need to punish them forever and ever. We want to stop the misbehavior and teach them that it's inappropriate. And you can use a logical consequence for that. But it's hard because it requires parents to stay calm. Because when it's when parents get upset that they yell, that they scream, that they spank, that they ground. If they will stay calm, then you have to use your intelligence and your creativity to go, okay, what's going to make sense with this? Because if you ask a child, if say a child um, goes to the other part of the neighborhood that they're not supposed to go to on their bicycle, and you spank them for it, and then a month later you say to them, hey, why'd you get a spanking a month ago? Well, I don't know. Mom's mean. But say you take you say you, that you do that, and then all of a sudden they're only for the next week they're only allowed to ride their bicycle with you watching them with your eye on them. Well, that's a lot of work on your part. But a month later you say to your child, "Why did you have to have mom watch you on your bicycle?" So I went to the other part of the neighborhood. They remember, and that's where we start teaching our kids because they start figuring out if I do this. Mom's probably going to say this is going to happen because that makes sense and I don't want that to happen, so I'm going to make a different choice. And that's where we start teaching responsibility. So what about talking back? Some specific misbehaviors. Talking back. How do you address that? <laughs> we get some of that with the teens. <laughs> and a lot of times we talk to parents and we say, you know, some of that is setting that boundary and some of the preventative work is establishing rules in the households. We communicate with respect and letting them know, you know what, I'm not going to talk with you while, while we're engaging this. When you're ready to talk about this, I'll be over here. And sometimes it kind of undercuts because they're mad and they're trying to get back at you or they're trying to throw something or they're trying to start something with you or they're trying to express themselves and they just need some redirection to figure out a way to do it in a more positive fashion. And so that's where a lot of times we'll just tell parents, you know, you don't need to engage in it. You don't need to have back and forth. You need to just say, you know what, 
in this house we communicate with respect so when you're ready to talk about it I'm more than happy to listen and walk away and don't engage in the back and forth with teenagers usually they'll calm down and they'll learn and they'll come back and they'll come back you'll, you'll be able to have a conversation because usually they're just angry about something that you've you know a rule that they got busted or they got in trouble or something and so giving them that time and saying this is how you appropriately handle things which is really your end goal right you want to be able to communicate in a more positive way and tantrums was something that we talked about as well as apparently there is a clinical right way to do a timeout. <laughs> so could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit better? Like managing tantrums and then how to do an effective timeout. I'll let her hit managing tantrums. <laughs> but timeout is one of those, we talked to a lot of parents and they said timeout just doesn't work. And then we explained to them how timeout is actually meant to be used. And it's a pretty simple concept in that First of all, kids need to know these are what the rules are, being giving them calm, clear rules so that they know, okay, if I do this, this is going to happen. And explaining to them that beforehand, before they ever get in trouble, sitting them down during like a house rules time and saying, if you get put in timeout, what that means is you sit here and timeout will not start until you are calm. That's one of the biggest keys is because kids get put in timeout, but they stay upset. They're upset that they're in timeout. They're crying, they're saying, I want out, I won't do it again, I promise. I, they're screaming, crying, throwing a tantrum. And parents begin the timeout and say they put them in timeout for three minutes because it's a three-year-old. At the end of three minutes, the child is still crying. But so the timeout wasn't used effectively. Letting kids know that when they are calm, the timer will start. And then the time needs to be appropriate. You know, some people say a minute for each age, but it's really for, you know, our program talks about for younger kids up until about two or three, two minutes is appropriate, and then three minutes until they're five. And just kind of, it basically, it's just enough time to calm them down at their age. So you make them wait until they're calm, then you set the timer. If they begin getting upset again during that time, the timer stops goes back and you wait until they're calm again and you start it again. You don't talk to kids when they're in timeout. You don't respond to them. They don't get up to go to the bathroom. They don't get up to get a drink of water. They, and they know all these rules ahead of time. And that way when they finish their timeout period, they're calm, you're calm, and when they come out, they know what they've done and you leave it at that that's when the punishment is over and that's where I think a lot of parents get caught with time out and say okay now what did you do and are you going to do it again and you know you, and just continuing to to talk about it instead of just saying this is what I want you to do don't state what you want negatively don't say don't throw your toys tell them I want you to play with your toys nicely on the floor so giving them that positive this is what I want to see okay tantrums <laughs> So I think one of the best ways to deal with tantrums or with your attention, again, thinking about younger children, they love your time and attention. What happens when a child's throwing a tantrum? We're telling them, get up off the floor, stop that crying, come here, do that. We're giving them lots of our attention. And so the tantrum usually continues. And I know this is a hard part for parents, but what I tell them is ignore them. Don't talk to them. You know, if they're not hurting themselves or hurting you, let them scream and kick on the floor and don't give them any attention. That means not looking at them. That means no eye therapy, <laughs> eye discipline, you know, because they're watching that and they know you're still paying attention. They know that I'm engaging mom, I'm engaging dad. And so the tantrum continues. If you turn your back, walk away, ignore them, keep an eye on them, the tantrum usually stops Quicker. They want mom's no longer talking to me, mom's not paying attention to me. What's going on in here? They just pop right up. <laughs> and that's a good time to use praise. Thank you for calming down. Thank you for using an inside voice. When you're calm, I can talk to you. So again, teaching them it's when you're calm that I can talk to you. And now that you're calm, we can figure out what we're gonna do next. So ignoring works really well. This also works well for um, just annoying behavior so that mom. Mom, mom, 
Mom. <laughs> if you ignore that long enough, they realize that's not working. I have to do something else. And when they wait quietly, they say, excuse me. Oh, thank you for waiting or thank you for saying excuse me. Now I can talk to you. What would you like? And so your attention is really powerful for helping children learn what's appropriate and what's not. If you're not paying attention to these inappropriate things, they realize that I'm no longer getting attention. What can I do differently to get attention? Thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm. In order for us to keep our promise and get you guys out of here by 1 o'clock, uh, we're going to move on in the program. But I wanted to let you know that our experts, our panel of experts, is going to be here after 1. So if you have specific questions for them that you'd like to visit with them about, please feel welcome to come on up and, and visit with them. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Ellen to close us out. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much, ladies, for being part of this today.